All righty. Are we live? Can people see us? I think, uh, yeah, if you are here, just maybe say something in the chat to let us know that you are hearing us, seeing us, that we're coming in clear. Not, not, not seeing anything yet, so I don't know. Okay, there's hey, a hey, hey. hey. Yeah. I don't know if that's reference to us or... <laughs> Maybe we'll just give it a second to see if people start to just confirm that we are live, that they see us. That would yes, be cool. we can see you. Great. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, great. Well, I want to say, uh, actually, just one note. I think there might be a slight lag between us going live and, and you've seen us. So if there is a bit of a delay in our answering of anything, don't worry, we got it covered. So yeah, I wanna I wanna just introduce you to Privacy on Cello. This is our midsummer event online. We're very excited to be exploring the Cello ecosystem this time around. So um, yeah, this is brought to you by the ZK Validator. I'm one of the co-founders of that. And I wanna tell you a little bit about the ZK Validator. We are a validator like many others. We do, we run infrastructure, we are, you know, running validators, but we also do something kind of unique. We support privacy and zero knowledge research. We do this by being advocates for privacy, participation and governance, supporting teams on these ecosystems, within these ecosystems, as well as launching initiatives to promote and fund ZK Tech. Uh, this is our awesome team. I have actually up here with me Agnieszka and Hector. Agnieszka is going to be running the show for most of today. Um, but and they're going to both be helping me with this intro. And we did leave one spot open. So if you are interested in finding out more, you know, we're always looking to hire great talent to join us. So let me tell you a little bit about the initiatives that we work on. One of the initiatives that ZK Validator um, kind of incubated was the ZK Hack platform initiative. Basically, what that is is a place for people to learn about zero knowledge tech. It's very, very much an educational spot. We have workshops, events, and content being created around that. That was host. That was basically incubated by the validator and my, my other org, which is the ZK Podcast. Um, and it's kind of becoming an initiative of, of its own. So if you're interested just in zero knowledge tech and learning more about how it works, that's a great place to check it out. We also at ZK Validator, we run, we co-run the ZK Tech Gitcoin side rounds. So this is on the Gitcoin CLR matching platform. It's on Gitcoin. It uses quadratic voting to basically deliver funds kind of more equitably to projects. And we, along with Zero X Park, put together these matching rounds. We've done three of them so far. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it's like in 300K range of funding that we've gotten into the hands of great ZK projects. Um, I should actually note that down for the next time I give this presentation, but it's really, really a cool initiative that we're happy to be part of. Other things we do are run ZK education and research focused events like this one in different networks. And we also run validators on Cello and Abacus now. So this is maybe something to note if you're learning about us for the first time, we are a validator on Cello and it would be cool for you to check us out. All right, Hector, take it away. Tell us a little bit about why this event. <laughs> Hi everyone, so uh, I'm Hector, uh, and why this event, right? So there are two main uh, milestones that need to happen for Web3 to reach mass, mass adoption. Um, one of them is to build products that are better than what's out there on, on Web2. And the second one is to have privacy by default, right? Um, right now, blockchains, as you know, uh, are anonymous, but are not private. Your information is out there in the chain, uh, available for everyone uh, to, to look at it. So uh, we do this type of events in the networks that we work uh, to promote privacy uh, and to help showcase the work that is uh, being done out there by many teams and many builders, and also uh, to make a case uh, for builders who are maybe not prioritizing privacy to actually uh, take a look at it and, and to consider it uh, to build products that are better than what's out there, but also uh, private in themselves. Um, so as you can see uh, on what Agnieszka is going to, to tell you uh, regarding the agenda, we have today um, a, a, an event full of uh, awesome talks and speakers to, to talk about this topic and especially on the Celo community. Yes, as Hector mentioned, for the past few uh, months, we were 
learning about the community, learning about its needs in terms of privacy. And when we started designing the program for this event, we wanted it to be both entertaining and educational. And we're pretty sure that we're going to deliver it for you today. So right after this intro, we're going to jump to the fireside on privacy together with Anna Present and here with us and with Marek Olszewski. After that, we're going to learn about Oblivious PRF, Plumo for Planck, Plumo itself, and at the end, poverty alleviation, digital payments, and fraud with our special guest from uh, Give Directly. At the end, we also prepared something very special for you. So, Hector, take it over. Yeah, so um, for this event, we have prepared uh, a special uh, pop up um, inspired on the uh, Silo um, logo. So, make sure you scan the QR code now or click on the link that we will be sharing on the, on the chat uh, to claim your pop up. Uh, and then let us know on Twitter what do you think about it and if you like it or not. So, uh, make sure you, you claim your pop up um, by the end of the event. Of course, you're going to get all those uh, links in the chat, so be sure to, to click on them. We thank you once again for joining, uh, for you to join us today. If you want to support us directly, please take your cello with us. All the information you have over here. And also, please remember that there is a little tab at the end, ask a question. You should see it at the bottom of the, of the screen. This is the place for you to ask the question to all the speakers that's going to be on stage. And right this moment, I would like to thank Hector for this uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, we're staying with Anna, and I would like to invite on the stage Marek Olszewski. Marek, I hope you're with us. Okay, Marek is joining. I think it's just me for now, but hopefully you're joining soon, Marek. Yes, Marek is joining at the moment. <laughs> cool. Hey. Hello. Hey. Hey, hey. How's it going? Good, good. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, really big fan of, of the series and, and what you guys are doing around privacy. This is awesome. Cool. I realized something, I didn't really introduce myself at the start of this, but I will now. So I have this, you know, I, I, I guess I did say I'm the co-creator co of ZK Validator and also the co-host of ZK Podcast. That's what I do a lot of the times, Ooh. interview people. Um, and what we're going to be doing over the next 20 minutes is basically doing sort of short form live interview. And Mar Marek, you've been on the show before. Actually, I think that's when we met. This is like three years ago. And I actually wanted- yeah, pre-COVID for sure. In person. <laughs> and back then we were talking about, I think we already had started talking about Plumo. So this is kind of cool that we come now full circle for it to be live and for us to be able to talk about its impact. But I wanted to kind of go back to that time and ask you, like, what was Cello when we first spoke and what do you think it's evolved into today? Yeah, great question. Great question. Um, and apologies uh, up front if I come across loopy or anything today. <laughs> I literally just got off uh, a flight uh, over the Pacific uh, to Korea. I'm here for um, Middle Asia and East Seoul. Uh, and, and it's in the middle of the night here. <laughs> so thanks uh, for apologies. jumping on. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, I guess that it, it's fun to do this in, in this state. You can ask me like difficult questions and I, and I won't be able to like evade them. I'll be too tired. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but thinking back to the early days, you know, maybe just, um, uh, oh, I'm not loopy enough for Kobe. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, thinking back to the early days of Cello. Um, so I guess, you know, five years ago, so a little before we, we last chatted in that podcast, um, the, the origin story for Cello started with us trying to build a kind of a global decentralized Venmo wallet uh, on top of Ethereum. Um, and we, and for those of you who, who aren't familiar with Venmo, Venmo is a, a P2P payments application, mobile application that's pretty common. Uh, in, in the US. Um, and it just really makes it quite easy on your phone to, to send value to, to anyone, sadly, only in the US. And so we, we really uh, wanted to, to bring something like that um, um, to um, 
uh, to a, like a fully global audience. Um, and we realized quite early on that it, it, Ethereum wasn't the right platform to deliver something that the consumers could be able to use uh, in a really easy to use way. Um, it, it just had a few, um, uh, a few, I guess, platform features that were missing. Um, and so what we ended up doing is actually building, um, focusing our efforts on Celo, which you can think of as a, a fully EVM compatible platform, uh, but with a few extra bonus features uh, that make it easy for you to build really easy to use mobile applications uh, for you know, the general public. Um, and um, you, know, you might be wondering what those extra features were. Yeah, I would say there's three really big ones, in addition to being proof of stake and, and highly scalable. Um, the, um, the features um, are like one, the ability to pay for gas with tokens. Yeah. Um, we knew that sending stable coins would be important for this use case and you know is an important use case in, in all of DeFi. But the idea of having to need a volatile asset to pay for those transaction fees, we knew that that would be too complicated for most people. And so we worked hard to uh, enable you to pay for transaction fees uh, with tokens and therefore with stable coins. Mm. Um, the second one was around identity. We wanted to make it really easy for, for folks to be able to send value to phone numbers um and not to you know these difficult uh and um intimidating public key derived addresses and so we built a decentralized phone verification protocol that uh, i think serves two purposes you can use it for civil resistance lightweight civil resistance but you can also use it uh to um, send value to a phone number even before the recipient has created a wallet uh, which is pretty neat uh, and then the third feature, which was the one that we focused on last time um, you had me on, and, and that was the, the light client. We wanted mobile apps to be able to communicate with the P2P network mm -hmm. in a fully decentralized manner without needing RPC servers that you know are prone to surveillance and, uh, and censorship. Um, and so we worked really hard to create a consensus protocol that um, uses ZK snarks to effectively prove that a header is part of the chain, which lets you sync um, in um, with just a few kilobytes of data, um, which is really neat. Cool. And there, that example you've given is just like using ZKPs, but in that case, it's more almost, I've, I've often used the kind of idea of compressing, it's using, using ZKP for compression, potentially for mm -hmm. scaling. But um, I do wanna bring in the topic of privacy, given the name of this event. Um, where does privacy fit into this vision for Celo? Is it on the right roadmap? Is it something still in the future or is it something you're thinking about today? No, hugely. Um, yeah, and I think because of the, the origins in, in payments, um, you know, I think privacy was just really um, an important focus for us uh, and continues to be. Um, I think if you, I think Hector said it perfectly just now, right? Like, I think if we really want Web3 to be adopted by everyone, you know, privacy is one of these primitives that needs to be universally available to everyone. Um, and it is certainly one of the things holding us back. And I think it's even more so important in payments than it is in DeFi today, because I think with DeFi today, it's mostly a single player use case. You're interacting with, you know, smart contracts that actually take away uh, the other counterparty in these neat ways. And so you don't have to worry too much about um, <clears throat> about revealing your identity when you're just using a, a pseudo anonymous um, wallet address. Uh, but the second that there's two parties involved with every transaction, every transaction that you're doing is revealing who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and everything you've done before, potentially. <clears throat> exactly. Every, everyone you've paid, any time you've bought something, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so I think, you know, DeFi today, I think of as just a sliver of what it will be in the future. Um, if we want to decentralize all the finance payments uh, are, are a big part of finance. And, uh, and that's something that that's going to really require, um, require privacy. Um, and then, you know, I think the other uh, interesting element here, too, is 
because Solo is good for sending stable coins around. Um, there's been some really interesting use cases uh, on top of the platform. Um, Impact Market is a great example of a, of a protocol that, that's been uh, giving out universal basic income uh, like payments uh, to, um, I think, on the order of 50,000 beneficiaries globally in some really adversarial um, places. Um, they operate in, in the Ukraine, for example, in, in Afghanistan, in, in Venezuela, among many other places. Um, and I think for these programs where you're you're giving away aid, and we're going to hear, uh, obviously, also from Give Directly later today, um, how do you recommend sticking around for that? Um, <clears throat> You know, for these programs, I think um, you know privacy is is equally, if not even more, important. Um, and and so certainly um, that's that's another reason why we're 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 very uh, just given the kinds of applications that have been built on the platform, um, it, it's just becoming more and more um, uh, important every day. I I want to talk a little bit more generally about the priorities in the cello ecosystem like maybe to also help us figure out kind of like where it falls like yeah what what are the what are the general focuses or yeah priorities would you say are currently there and yeah where is where's privacy on that yeah so it's a really great question um <clears throat> so i would say there's two trends happening right now on solo uh one is around mobile payments and that kind of um uh, has um, been there from the beginning based on kind of the origin story that I just um, kind of mentioned. Um, there's a lot of effort right now, for example, around creating a stable coin for every country in the world uh, and creating on and off ramps in every one of those countries using um, kind of an open standard called Fiat Connect. Um, but there's another trend that's happening too around refi. Um, Cello. Um, when we launched it, the first governance proposal that we did was to um, was one that would um, effectively have the network pay uh, programmatically to buy carbon offset credits from Project REN to, to offset the carbon that, that it was emitting. It was only a little bit of carbon because Celo's a proof of stake network, um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but still we wanted to... Um, like the community felt strongly about, about the network being fully carbon neutral. It turns out it's actually carbon negative because we end up buying more than we're actually estimated to be to be uh, emitting. Cool. Um, and I think because of that, yeah, it's neat. Uh, and I think because of that, um, there's been a, a lot of uh, interest from the broader refi community uh, to build on top of Celo and, and now um, Celo is, is becoming this really nice um, kind of hub for refi. Um, and so that certainly is, is quite interesting. I, I do see the two things um, having some overlap, which is, uh, which is pretty great. And I can get into more details in a bit. Um, but yeah, um, cool. those are the two kind of higher level, um, I would say, trends that are happening on the platform. I, I want to ask a question that I feel is going to show like some ignorance on my part. I don't think I've ever actually covered refi. Uh, what does it stand? What does it stand for? Is it renewable? Mm -hmm. What like what does it stand for? And where does it actually come from as a concept? It's confusing because you know people refi their house, refinance their house uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. from time to time. Oh darn! But <clears throat> but this is not that kind of refi. Um, okay. So refi stands for regenerative finance. Um, I would say it's broadly um, a category that you know draws from DeFi, but um, but tries to or aspires to have positive externalities um, rather than negative ones. These can be around climate change. A lot of refi protocols today um, have elements that help fight climate change. Uh, people do a lot of people uh, in, in the broader community feel that climate change is a, you know, massive existential threat to, uh, to the whole planet. And if we, you know, whatever we do uh, outside of that may not matter uh, for too long if, if we don't get a grip on this. And so um, I think these Web3 platforms, one of the really nice things about 
um, you know, just having programmable money is that you can really experiment with new and interesting ideas at a much faster rate than, than you could before. Um, and creating economic systems that have those positive externalities, that's like perfectly ripe for, for experimentation. Cool. I want to go back to sort of link those that back into privacy. Is there really a need for privacy in refi? Yeah. Um, so I think one way where refi and payments really fit in nicely together um, is mm. this idea of creating stable coins that are backed by natural capital or by refi assets that are kind of helping fight climate change. Um, so a lot of stable coin protocols today um are you know ultimately backed their stable assets with other assets usdc backs it with fiat um but um you know even uh, protocols like dai ultimately back their stable coins with other crypto assets um and um refi assets like for example tokenized uh, carbon offset credits or tokenized trees or even I've heard people talk about tokenized uh, affordable housing. Um, these assets tend to be a little bit more stable. Uh, and so you actually get benefits from a stability perspective to, to put them in the reserves that back these stable coins. But the other thing that um, I think is really neat, and we had this advisor, Charles Eisenstein. He's a fairly well-known author. Highly recommend his books, especially Sacred Economics. Um, in that book, he had this idea that um, before even Bitcoin was around, that you know whatever backs money, uh, people value more of in the world, and so why not back money by things that we want to see more of in the world? And so mm. he talk, talked about backing money by by trees, um, and he had this big, difficult, convoluted plan for how central banks could work together to make this happen. Of course, it didn't happen, but now. Um, at the rate of experimentation that, that we're going through with, with DeFi, we can actually try these things. Um, and so, so I think that's the link. Um, I, I truly think privacy is super important for payments. Um, but uh, at the same time, I'm really excited about not just being able to vote with my dollar, but also to be able to vote on which dollar I use. Um, oh. Is it one that... Um, that is ultimately having these positive externalities. Um, and so so that that gets me excited. Um, cool. Beyond that, um, you know, I think there is this belief that the voluntary carbon offset uh, credit market is going to just explode. It's a lot of companies that have made commitments to go carbon neutral by 2030. And uh, a lot will hopefully reduce their emissions but um, they're not going to be able to reduce them to zero. And so there's going to be a lot of people buying these carbon offset credits. Um, and one of the big kind of goals of refi is to make all these companies do it on, on public chains. Um, and um, it's really nice because it prevents double spending of these, of these assets, which is a problem. It, it makes mm -hmm. certification also more clear. Uh, and also you can have much more efficient markets around purchasing them. And so I was thinking before this talk, like, is privacy important there? On one hand, when you retire the asset, you want to do that in a very public way mm. because you're making a commitment for climate change. Um, but when you're purchasing those credits, I think maybe then you won't want to be front run. You may want to actually, you might make an announcement, but you may, yeah, not want to be front run around that. So maybe there's some interesting yet to be, I think, yeah. Um, discovered use cases there. Yeah. I have I have a small idea here. It's like if it became sort of automated that part of some payment always goes towards these things, actually keeping those private would be as important as the payment itself because you might actually be able to figure out what someone's spending. It, even if they've somehow made their payment private, if you're actually seeing the credit come through. Or their Definitely. Credit payment. I think donations are are a huge, huge area where privacy is needed. Um, I think typically people donate for causes they care about, but some of these causes may um, may be causes where there isn't 100% agreement. Um, mm. Where they could um, get in trouble for supporting those things. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, I think if, you know, like the 
classical example is donating for abortion rights uh, with credit cards, you know, anti-abortion um, kind of organizations sometimes buy like that credit card data and, and actually yeah. target folks who are doing that. And so I think obviously this is an area where privacy is really important. I want to take, I want to sort of pivot a little, I think we have five minutes left in this uh, portion of the event. And I want to talk a little bit about, this is maybe going back to ZK for scaling, this idea of multi-chain versus cross-chain, this conversation that had been happening, should people, like, should all blockchain scaling happen through roll-ups, the most secure of bridges, are bridges okay? I mean, there's constant conversation about this and we're hearing about, you know, things happening in the bridge front. So I'm curious here, does, like, does Celo have a roll-up strategy or, and, like, we are also validators on Abacus, so we know that, like, there's also a bridging strategy. I'm just curious what you're thinking about in terms of security when it comes to that. Yeah, really great question. Um, yeah, I, th I think this is a fascinating topic and it's so interesting to try to imagine where the world will go. Um, I think the all of the different bridge hacks clearly show that getting bridges right is difficult. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not 100% convinced that rollups won't have the same types of vulnerabilities that we've seen um, in, in these bridges. Um, I think um, in many cases, they tend to be implementation related issues. And, and the fact that these bridges just have really big um, holdings of assets just make mm -hmm. them targets. Um, coming to Celo, you know, I think yeah, Abacus is a really great protocol. Um, we're uh, huge fans of what they're building. Uh, Abacus spun out of C-Labs, uh, one of the companies that I work for that helped um, build out a lot of the core infrastructure for Celo. Um, and um, really big fan of their design and their approach um, and, and just uh, um, the team behind it. Um, at the same time, and I think one of the advantages of bridges is that you can bridge more freely to more places. Mm -hmm. People like to move assets to lots of places. Uh, the freedom, I think, will always be something that people will value. And so I think multi, I think bridges um, will will always exist. Um, I do think that rollups offer interesting security um, guarantees that, that uh, are certainly worth um, exploring. Um, you asked about the Celo roadmap. One of the things that we're doing at Celo is uh, bringing Narwhal, which is a um, really interesting uh, mempool um, protocol. Um, and um, when you pair it with Bullshark, it creates a very, very efficient consensus protocol that allows a lot of um, high throughput transactions. Um, Mistin Labs, um, one of the um, Wiston Labs is is kind of the main company that's working on this, um, and then they're also um, they have a long term strategic partnership with the Celo Foundation. They're also bringing Move support, uh, so Celo will um, um, hopefully soon be kind of the first chain that supports side by side uh, EVM and Move uh, support, which I think will be fairly interesting. Uh, for developers who are excited by both languages, you know, I think no one, like Solidity is, is clearly here to stay. It's the amount of code written, um, the amount of um, value that's being secured by it uh, means that it's like just leagues ahead of everyone else. Um, but if you want to have high throughput, if you want to do payments, if you want to do these things, um, Move allows you to parallelize a lot of transactions in interesting ways. And so, uh, we think there's a place for for both languages in the Celo ecosystem. Um, and then on the topic of rollups, one of the nice things about Narwhal is that it it is a, it can play a really interesting data availability role in the network. And so we are also looking at using it uh, as as a place for uh, for rollups to post fraud proofs as well. Um, we think that's pretty interesting as well. Very cool. Um, I think we're basically at time. I did have more questions about Plumo, but luckily we have an entire, we have actually two talks which are gonna to be touching upon Plumo coming up very soon. So yeah, I wanna say thank you so much for the fireside chat slash rapid fire interview. 
uh, yeah, when absolutely. you're jet lagged in Seoul. So I <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> okay, I got my tea here keeping me going. Keeping so. you going, very good. Okay, thanks so much, Merrick. Yes, absolutely. thank you. Thank you very much for both of you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Marek. I hope you're gonna stay with us for the rest of the event. If there's any questions, remember about the Ask Question tab uh, below. And now I would like to introduce to the stage Victor Graf that is going to talk about Oblivious PRF. Just a second, let me pull Victor on the stage. Okay. Victor, I hope you hear us. If you're there, just let us know, maybe in the chat, because I already sent you an invitation for the stage. Okay, once again. Yeah, this is what always happens, right? Okay, I see Victor is joining. Hi. Hello, hello. How's it going? So, yeah. Perfect. So, so, the stage is yours for the next 20 minutes. All right, great. Yeah, so I guess I am here to talk about Oblivious PRFs uh, and what are they good for. Um, let me just share my slides real quick. All right, so we're gonna talk about a few things and I'm kind of a very kind of application purpose oriented person. So we're gonna kind of focus on, you know, what we're using them for and then we're gonna get into the math. Um, and additionally, there was quite a few additional use cases. So I'm gonna focus on two to start with, contact discovery and account recovery. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of additional use cases and maybe some other places that OPRF show up after the fact. So let's talk, about, let's talk about contact discovery first. So why, what is contact discovery kind of why do we need it? So essentially the idea is if you start out with some well-known identifier, your uh, DNS name, your ENS name, a phone number, email address, Twitter handle, people use those identifiers as roots of trust to know how to contact, know identity for people online. And these roots of trust are important because they are kind of short, easily memorable, uh, pieces of information that can identify individuals uh, and can be used for all kinds of other interactions. So basically, bootstrapping from one identifier to another is a really common pattern. So Signal, Telegram, WhatsApp, they all use phone numbers as their source of trust, even though the phone, the phone, the phone number itself is kind of, is not the important part. But the fact that you have something to start off with, something that basically people are identifiable by, uh, allows you to then uh, actually bootstrap a whole identity system. Email addresses are also used by, by things like PayPal and Zelle, as well as phone numbers. And then kind of Keybase is, kind of, is a example application where, some, where it is designed explicitly to take all the all your identifiers and kind of tie them together into a more of a uh, unified global identity that can be used to contact people in a secure manner. So uh, when we want to, one of the kind of problems you end up with here is that you may want a one-way mapping. So you may want your someone to like who's your phone number to be able to find your telegram handle. But it's definitely not the case that you always want a reverse mapping of these, like if you are mapping from one direction. So if someone has a, my telegram handle, I do not want them to, to be able to find my phone number, for instance. Uh, and if you uh, additionally like if maybe someone has my email address, I want them to find my my Ethereum Ethereum address so they can send me send me, send me a payment. Uh, and on Celo in particular, uh, this is basically that we uh, have a system, which I'm gonna talk about a bit more uh, called Otis that allows you to take a phone number and then map it to your uh, your cello address. And so because these sor the source identifier has such low entropy, uh, they're not very big. They, uh, you can easily guess the entire space. You could also, you can also, if you start off a list of let's say well-known emails, you can try all those. Uh, it makes it difficult to make sure this one, map one way mapping actually stays one way. And so in order to, to make that the case, you need some kind of rate money solution or some way of having queries cost 
the uh, person who's querying something. And so in this case, uh, messaging apps such as Telegram, Signal, WhatsApp, they all implement kind of a contact discovery service, which has uh, rate limiting that they control centrally. So basically, they might use captures, they might use other information, they might use they use some kind of combination of identifiers, which allow them to rate limit uh, queries for contacts from from users. And these systems are not always perfect. In fact, uh, there's been some research in the past about breaking these kind of centralized mechanisms. And by no means are the rate limiting functions always uh, perfectly designed. Uh, password hashes, which actually have a very similar problem, low entropy. Uh, they want to uh, take a low entropy space, which is passwords, and map it to a one, map it through a one-way function to a password hash, which allows them to do authentic authentication checks. Uh, they use they usually use computationally expensive functions, so like Scrypt, Argon two, their hard compute. So basically, it makes it it turns into a one-way function through that that way. Having a a rate limited PRF service would kind of be a similar idea. That's what we're going to talk about here. So I see if you have a PRF service, the the core idea is that you have Alice who basically has a message. The message might be a password, might be a phone number, might be something they just some kind of some, something they want to kind of uh, use for this, this mapping idea. And they'll pass it to this, this Oracle or the service. And the, the, more, the Oracle at this point is kind of vaguely defined. But the key here is the Oracle does some kind of authorization check. This might be just a simple rate limit saying like, you know, no more than X messages per second can be, can be mapped. Uh, or run the PRF. It might be uh, a cost, like each message requires a payment. It might be some kind of authorization check where they have to have some some credential in order to use the service. But basically, the Oracle applies some kind of authorization predicate, and then if the predicate passes, they'll pass back uh, a keyed PRF uh, that to which the Oracle only has a key for over the message. That's kind of the high level idea. Although there are some kind of issues with this. Uh, if implemented in the most simple way. So let's talk about some of those issues. So I see the first one being that the Oracle in this case, like if you actually implement it as a single server, is both trusted uh, to basically with the rate limiting function. Basically, they alone control the rate limit. And, the, and if you're staking your privacy of your contacts, so basically, for example, in the case of, of Celo, uh, if you're using this as a, as a directory service and you're passing your phone number and getting out the account, like an account identifier, um, then like the, that rate limit is important to ensure that nobody can reverse the, the account account to reverse the mapping and from the account to get the phone number, which we would not want. And so basically that is, there's trust there. And it's also additionally, the Oracle sees the, sees the message if you if implement it naively. And so that's going to be one of the main focuses we're going to talk about with OPRFs, which is which basically make the Oracle oblivious. They do not see the message at all when they do this. So they only, the Oracle only sees information that they use for authorization. Um, and the, uh, the first the first one we'll talk about in a, in a little bit later. So let's talk about let's actually get into the the math a bit more and talk about OPRFs. So we're going to need some kind of cryptography primitives to start with. We're going to use uh, bilinear pairing groups. So basically, have G1 and G2, which are two elliptic curves. Uh, they there is a asymmetric pairing which maps the which maps to a point from each curve to a target group, generators, uh, it's kind of so on and so forth. And key here is addi an additional piece is the predicate. So this predicate is essentially is a stand-in, uh, takes in context information and basically just returns true or false whether or not the service should on, on the request. And that's key because that, that is the predicate basically is the main kind of value that the uh, PRF service is adding to the system uh, over just simple offline PRF, such as, you know, HMAC. Um, in order to do key gen in, this, in a single server example, which we're going to start with, uh, you just pick a secret key uniformly from uh, the scalar field. So basically just kind of, this is exactly the same as you might imagine for an ECD, ECDSA key. Um, and then the public keys exist in G2 for this uh, example. And so what does the actual protocol look like? So in this case, uh, the, the message itself is M. And the client basically starts out with by blinding the message. So that's, this is the first part um, that you see on the left. Basically, uh, the client samples a random value from from the scalar field raises the takes take a takes a, a hash a hash to group of the message and then raises the message to that power 
So basically this produces what's called a blinded point. This, this blinded point is actually information theoretically indistinguishable from random at this point. And so that that the key there is actually anyone who sees this uh, X hat, with which is the blinded message, without without knowing the blinding factor, get uh, obtains absolutely zero information about the underlying message itself. And that and that blind message is basically is what the server receives. So basically, we can guarantee that that no matter what the service does, they can't learn anything about the message that you send you send to it. Now, the service basically over here, the first that they do. They check this authorization predicate. This might, this would be a rate limit, cost function, whatever kind of mentioned before. Uh, basically, they want to check to make sure that actually you pass before they serve you serve your requests. Now, in order to actually uh, do the PRF, uh, the PRF in this case is a fairly simple one. Basically, just take the uh, X hat, take the binary message, raise it to the zero key. Uh, essentially, this is you know one half of a Diffie Hellman oracle, uh, effectively. Um, and then that, that results in the blinded output. So this, this output additionally has uh, conveys no information about the input itself, at least in absence of, of the blinding factor R, and sends the blinded output back to this, back to the client. Now the client at this point can actually use a pairing check, uh, very similar to how BLS signature works, to uh, verify that the output matches the input and the public key. Once they're convinced that basically that that is the case, that this is a verified interaction, and this is not always true of all PRFs, I mean all OPRFs. So actually, some of the more more widely deployed OPRFs do not include verifiability. But in the, the, one, the one we're talking about here, the this is basically a BLS signature based OPRF does include verifiability. And once they're convinced that that the uh, output matches the input, they can unblind it by raising it to the inverse of the blinding factor. So now they have the output of the PRF. Basically, uh, if you were to take this like this Oracle system before, uh, the the kind the combined interaction between the two now influence this PRF function, which can take your phone number, map it to a hash, and the hash can basically be used as a somewhat public value. You can put that on you can put that on chain. You can put that wherever you want, and basically people without access to, without additionally going through the PRF service, can't can't really figure out can't do a uh, there's cannot do a reverse mapping from the identifier back to your phone number again. And now, so far we talked about the, the so far we talked about the issue of the Oracle learning about your message, and we kind of solved that. We haven't talked about the the uh, rate limiting trust. So in this case, we're going to uh, use a distributed trust assumption instead of trusting any any single service. Um, in this case. Uh, so what we what we actually want instead of trusting a single service is to, is to trust maybe a threshold of distributed parties, and this is kind of what we can what we're able to achieve uh, with the cryptography that we have. And so in this case, and the case of Otis, which is currently deployed on on Celo, we have uh, like five of, of seven parties are required to evaluate the function. And so instead of having a single key for the PRF, you split the key across. Uh, all seven parties or all nine parties or however many parties you have. Um, and basically you'd set a somewhat arbitrary threshold depending on what your security level, at, what you security versus availability you want and have that threshold be the minimum number in order to actually evaluate the function. So this is where we're gonna introduce some threshold cryptography. Uh, and so, <laughs> and so uh, the, in this case, we need a new key gen. So basically, we're going to select n parties and a threshold of tau. Um, and we're going to generate key shares. So in this case, I don't talk about exactly how these keys are generated, but but you could, for example, use a Pedersen DKG, or you can use uh, a different DKG as long as you get kind of an algebraically related set of keys. And that that is defined right here in this slide. So basically, you generate a key shares. Each secret key is is f of i for some f that you generated via the DKG. And every party i holds S sk sub i. Um, f is a polynomial in the scalar scalar field of, of order tau minus one, and so f of zero is the, is the kind of like global secret key or the master key, and the public key is g two to the raised to the power of f, f zero. So this is very analogous to the to the the single server case. So this is this is the same protocol again. The, the, the only difference, the two differences here, instead of either being one server, 
there are now n servers, uh, each each it's server server sub i, and each server sub i uses their secret key secret key sub sub i to uh, calculate a partial a partial blinded output, and the client receives all the partial blinded outputs, combines them to 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 form the single uh, full full blinded output, does the verification check on the full blinded output, and then returns the unblinded version. Um, so in this case now. Uh, not only is it that, that none of the servers see any information about the message, they additionally um, they additionally uh, cannot individually uh, evaluate the PRF, and you need a threshold of five of seven. So you need to corrupt at least five parties before the PRF rate limiting function uh, becomes invalid. Invalid. All right. So this is that was talking about uh, contact discovery. But this, another use case is kind of in account recovery. Uh, in particular, here we are talking about the challenge of, you know, if we want to empower the unbanked, if we want to actually make a real system that causes, that creates, makes a massive change for people, people cannot be at risk of losing their savings. Now, especially when you're talking about people with one device, uh, you kind of end up coming back to passwords and bank codes. Uh, we kind of try to avoid them because, you know, everyone knows the problems of passwords, but they are actually a useful tool. They're a source of entropy that people can remember. They do not. They don't rely on fancy techniques, and people are fairly familiar with them. And so passwords and pin codes are actually a fairly useful primitive for account recovery. And this is kind of validated by the fact that uh, a lot of systems out there, you know, kind of still use them. Uh, we're, what we're going to talk about right now is an example of an account recovery system you can build. That, although there are many, so this is encrypted backups. So encrypted backup basically you want to store your uh, store an encrypted backup file in some place with authenticated storage. So you need at least an account, one account to access it, which is like Google Drive or iCloud. You need a Google account or, iCloud or an iCloud account to access your that storage. And then additionally, because that's definitely not good enough, you need a strong encryption on that backup. And the strong encryption come, needs to come from something that, that the user knows. So password or pin code are good options, but those are not, those are also, those, those are not strong enough as encryption keys. So in this case, we're gonna talk about using it using the, P the PRF service as a way to harden these keys. Uh, this is kind of similar to Apple, Apple iCloud, Keychain, Signal, SVR, or WhatsApp end-to-end -end backups, but distributed and using uh, oblivious PRFs. Um, right, and so actually instead of, uh, uh, one of the kind of issues we see here is we don't just need one PRF, we need a PRF for every single user. In this case, we're gonna introduce a partially oblivious PRF. And so this is this is one slightly more complicated. I'm not going to I'm not going to go through all the different all the math here. But the core here is that in addition to the message m, you can see in the request function, there's also additional input ta uh, tag t, and that tag t is visible to both the client and it's also visible to the server. You can think of it kind of as a salt, like a password, like a salt you'd use for password hashing. So there are very similar. There's a very similar flow overall, but slightly more kind of elements at play. Uh, but the, the the key effect here is that instead of just doing the, the kind of the simple uh, the, 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 the half diffy Hellman function before, we're going to use the pairing group in the uh, the PRF output that allows us to, com to combine together the, the tag and the message into one output. And then that will give us a blinded output that's in the target group, uh, which can be aggregated and unblinded just as just as before. It's also verifiable. Um, via a interactive construction between between the two, that requires no additional messages. So the flow is is very very similar to before. The the properties are very similar to be, as before, but now we have an initial input a tag t, and this is a very useful primitive and also basically is an extension upon the OPRF, which has a lot of uses. So OPRFs are also found in password authentic key, key exchange through uh, like an OPIC protocol. Anonymous credentials through privacy pass. Google Private VPN uses a similar construction, or they use blind RSA. Um, uh, pretty good phone privacy is basically is often automatic credential based phone network authentication. Apple AirDrop uses Air, uses OPRFs between two phones in order to, to figure out if they overlaps. Uh, Apple CSAM detection uses OPRFs to figure out if something is matching a content content hash without actually revealing the hash itself from the local device. Uh, and there's also privacy preserving log, log collection through a number of parties like Facebook and Mozilla that also utilizes OPRFs. So super useful, broadly applicable primitive. Um, really excited. I really like excited about it a lot. 
So let's talk about deployment just very, very briefly, which basically uh, oh, the OPRF, and OPRF has been deployed on cell mainnet since April 2020, since mainnet launch. We use it in the Oblivious directory service I mentioned very briefly before. This is used for phone number mappings. The POPRF is currently being rolled out as an extension to Otis and includes a, a flexible framework for rate limit, for defining rate limiting functions that will first be used in account recovery, but is extensible to a large number of other applications. All right, thanks y'all. Thank you very much, Victor. I hope you will stay with us till the end. Mm -hmm. And now a little bit of change in the agenda. And I would like to introduce to the stage Kobe Gergen that is going to talk about Plumo. I hope Kobe is ready. Yes, I see we're connecting with Kobe. Fantastic. No worries, Luke is going to be back right after this speech, so everything is okay. We just had to switch a little bit, and then we're going to go back to Plumo for Plonk. Hello, hello. hello. Are you the thinking? stage is yours. Thank you very much. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Kobe. I am... <laughs> Thanks for the, for the compliment on the head. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, doing cryptography on Celo. Also today, I'm head of research in uh, Geometry. And yeah, today I want to tell you about uh, what we've been doing with Pluma over the last few years. And since we've presented it and, um, you know, did a few things with it, uh, I want to show you where we are. Okay, so let me share my screen. And let's talk about the slides. OK. All right, so first I want to start with a recap of Plumo, what it is. So Merck touched on that a bit in the fireside chat with Anna. And I want to, to give a longer recap to, to show you what it's like. So Plumo is an ultralight client for Celo. It uses Snarks to basically compress the blockchain and enable you to sync directly to the latest uh, state of the solar blockchain by verifying a very small proof, a few kilobytes, and you know what's the latest state. So how can that happen and why is it important? So Can we just one second yes. because we can't see your slides? Oh, you cannot. No, we still cannot see your slides. Oh, oh no. Okay. I think it may be my fault. But the hat is amazing. Thank you. Um, oh no, I think I might have a problem sharing. Okay, maybe that works. Yes, now we can see it. Can still see it? Yeah, we can see it, yeah. OK, awesome, good. All right, so we're going to cover why we're doing Plumo and why is it important. So when you're talking about uh, doing simple payment verification, which was described a while ago, you know, it was described by Satoshi in 2008. And for that, you need to get the headers of the Bitcoin blockchain. And once you have headers, you can verify inclusion of transactions because a header contains um, a list of transactions that have been performed um, in, uh, in each block. And using that uh, property, you can use the Merkle tree uh, that is committed in that block uh, to show that the transaction is included. So that's a very uh, efficient method and lightweight method for clients like mobile phones to show or to verify the transactions uh, have been really been broadcasted and accepted on the chain. But in order to do that, you still have to download a bunch of Bitcoin headers. Or if you look at Ethereum, you still have to download a bunch of Ethereum headers. And that's quite a lot of the data to download. It's like megabytes, gigabytes, depends on the chain. And 
that's not really suitable when you're talking about doing this in resource constrained environments and which we would include mobile phones in places where you have bad data connection or that you want to keep seeing or that you're talking about let's say a browser experience where you just want to instantly and be able to check something about the latest state in the chain um, so that's why we uh, designed the consensus uh, protocol in Celo to use the cryptographic primitives that would allow it to be efficiently verifiable. So first of all, Celo is a proof of stake network and it's permissionless. Um, it's a decentralized network that has um, more than a hundred validators running at the same time. It uses a BFT protocol, meaning that you have a set of validators um let's say validating the correctness of each block um, and every day or more correctly every epoch which today is around the day um, a validator set election happens and the validator set changes so if we're thinking about what that let's say naive proof of stake light client would be in order to verify the validity of the cello consensus, what we need to do is to, if we talk about it naively, we need to download each block. We need to check that it's signed by a majority of the validator set. We need to verify that validator set elections uh, happen and update the validator set accordingly, like replace the public keys. And um, yeah, so th that's naive because um, Celo has a five second block time, which means that if we verify the signatures for each block, and if we did it, let's say with ECDSA signatures, which would be you know, hundreds of signatures per block, this would be quite heavy. In a day, you have around 17,000 blocks. So that's not very nice. So in order to do that, we introduced a few improvements. One of them is that you change the validator set every day. And the other one is that we use BLS signatures, uh, which allow you to collect all the signatures from different validators and bring them all into one single signature. And the latest thing is that, you know, now we, we improved quite a bit. Let's say that we now need to, in order to learn the validity of the latest state, we only need to check what is the current validator set and check that the current validator set has signed the latest state. Um, but additionally, if we do this over a long period of time, let's say uh, a year or two, um, then this already becomes heavy because then you have to verify the election for every day. So, you know, 360 headers that already brings us back to something which becomes heavy. So this is why we use snarks in order to compress all of that into a single proof so that you have, let's say, the block, uh, the Genesis block where you have some initial validator set and the block a year after where you have the output validator set after all these 365, I guess, a quarter days. Uh, all right, just shortly um, recapping what the SNARKs prove. And we, we check that the validator set progressed according to election results. We check in the SNARK that the aggregate BLS signature is correct. And we do the election um, processing and show the transition. And eventually we have as an output from the SNARK only two things, the initial validator set, and the final validator set. We don't need to output all the intermediate ones. And we do that um, using techniques um, that we learned from the Zexi paper. And it's depth to recursion. It uses these elliptic curves, which one of them sits on top of the other, and the BLS12377 and BLW6 on top of it. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that because I want to show you what we've been doing on the application level, but I would encourage you to reach out if you're interested in that specific area. All right, 
So what happened since we, you know, last, last I talked about Plumo, let's say, in a, in a presentation? First of all, we got Plumo to a stage where it can be run on the mainnet. So CIP22 has been a major upgrade which uh, has been deployed a while ago. Um, and it defined the, the structure of some special field in the cellar block header that uh, is happening every day, which creates a snark-friendly representation of the validator set. And this is a kind of the magic ingredient which allows us to verify this efficiently in the snark. And the second thing is, since we're using a growth 16 snark, we've done the multi-party computation setup. We had uh, tens of participants in each of the phases. The growth 16 setup needs two phases, phase one, phase two. And um, um, Anna was uh, deeply involved in making that happen. Um, and the last thing is that we um, created this persistent proving service which every day, whenever there is an epoch change as a new validator set is elected, we are producing, we're actually producing on this huge server that we rent and the Pluma proofs. And we provide two libraries, um, which are called Pluma Verifier and Pluma Verifier Web, and which one of them is a Node.js library and the other is a packaging of it into WebAssembly that allow you to consume Pluma proofs and run them on, uh, on these devices. It could be even a mobile phone. And by that, getting access to the latest state. Now, maybe some of you may think, you know, I have access to the state of Celo, which is a commitment to, to the state, which is a state root. It's a Merkel Patricia tree. It's the same storage layout uh, as Ethereum. And that gets you somewhere, but it's not the end because now that you have access to the state, you, you need to do some queries on the state. So you can think about you know, what you can do with this. So now that you have a small proof where you have proof of the correctness of the state, you can combine it with another proof. It could be either a proof in plain text or it could be a snark proof. So you can prove ownership of an NFT, you can prove balance of a user, and you can maybe even prove ownership of an NFT privately. Uh, I, I will show a project that can do it, which is called ZK Tester. Um, but basically, uh, the message that I'm trying to convey here is now that you have access to this Merkle root, which is the commitment to the state, you can basically do any query and using, and you can do that in a snark, in a ZK snark completely privately and prove um, something, some insight from the blockchain. So you can think about if you want to get to some party and you have, um, a board ape or whatever, and then you know board ape equivalent on uh, on cello, but uh, you can show that you're the owner of one, but you don't really have to show which one of those you are, or if you want to show that you have above some balance of some token, you can do that as well. And because all of these things are quite small, because they are snarks, you can embed them into some kind of QR codes. I will tell that you maybe need in the, those GIF QR codes, which are animated, but you, you can do that. Um, yeah, so this is one cool thing that you can do. And yeah, some other directions that you can think about now that you have access to a SNARK verified state of Celo, you can also think about building this kind of bridges, which are light client bridges and which use snark to snarks to verify validity of uh, the state on another blockchain and since cello has um instant finality that is very attractive uh yeah so that's more or less what i had to show just quickly for anyone that is interested in trying these things out oh you're seeing all my calendar now not good 
then yeah, you can see here, uh, this is the repository that I mentioned, the Promo Verifier, uh, some code examples on how to um, verifiably fetch your balance. Um, this is the method that actually does it. And this is something, the ZK Tester project that I mentioned, which can take a state root from Ethereum or Celo, it doesn't matter, and prove in zero knowledge something about the state of Ethereum. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Thank you very much, Kobe. And we are ready for our next speaker, which is Luke Pearson. And Luke is going to talk about Plumo for Plonk. So Luke, the stage is yours. Just a second, Luke is connecting. There we go. Hello, how is that? Oh, we can't see you. You won't be able to see me. Um, unfortunately, oh. I've used use a laptop where the camera is broken, but you can imagine a, a very smiling face. <laughs> okay, so the stage is yours now. Okay, let me go to the screen share. Can you see my screen? Not yet. I'm looking for the screen share button. You should have it if you hover above your uh, name and last name. Should be like a little computer with an arrow pointi pointing right. Yeah, where it says share. Oh, there I am. Yes, yeah, sorry. With a strange, very digitized uh, emoji. Now? Not yet. It's... Philip is asking if you have a hat. Shall we imagine you in a hat? Imagine me in a, 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 big, a big hat and a smiling. <laughs> in a very dark room? Very. Is that working now? No, not yet. I will tell you once we can see it. Okay, that's strange. Maybe it requires me to... Just... I'll share a window and not full screen. Thank you, Kobe. Yeah, there's three options you can you can share, so try all of them. Window and picture. Does it work now? Not yet. Okay. Um, let me try this like this. That's what always happens at the live events on the world. Yeah, it's just this. I, I <laughs> see, it says share screen window. Let's even just try Chrome tab. Yeah, I think Chrome is the best. Chrome is the best. So I can take okay. you off the stage and oh, 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 now it's something is happening. Yeah. yeah, we're in. Yeah, now we can oh. see it. Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. Well, um, first of all, thank you for the uh, the patience. I had a bit of a disaster. I'm away. I'll soon be in Korea like Marek, but but not there not there yet. And all five other parties of crypto people here did not bring a laptop charger, so they're borrowing mine very aggressively, shall we say? But yeah, um, thanks for the, the the invitation to come to the to the seller community to, to Anna, Kobe, Agnes. It's going to be hopefully very fun. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, Plumo for Plonk. So I was kind of slightly happy that Kobe went before me anyway. So we gave a bit of overview of uh, what the protocol is and um, 
and, and, and how it looks. And during this presentation, I'm going to go into some of the inner workings and some of the parts that he uh, that he described. So the, the, the sinking of blocks and the epochs and even a little bit at the end that we saw the, the diagram with the Merkel trees. It's interesting, I think, at this stage of the, uh, the, the global ZK SNARK roadmap to look into what existing techniques and potentially alternative uh, proving systems to the, to, the, to the flagship one where um, Plumo is currently implemented in the, the Celo GitHub, the Groth 16, uh, and what, what kind of advantages that can be brought to, to potentially improve, potentially add privacy. Um, yeah, to, uh, to work. So let's look at uh, what the contents are going to be. So have a little quick look at this little hoppy snark that allows people to jump around set, set epochs for half year intervals or, or however people choose to, to, to implement and design the Plumen protocol and then talk about R1CS or Flexi. And I use the word Flexi here quite loosely because what's actually happening um, at the moment in a side project that I'm, I'm, I'm doing or, or working on Z Prize is it is for Plonk. Uh, however, the, the main point of uh, how you can get higher degrees of expressionism is sort of an R1CS style. So this A times B equals C for all gates or this sort of flexible gate style. So it's kind of started with Plonk, but now we're seeing Plonk and all of its variants, all of its Plonkish and Plonk up and Plonky and Plonky 2, and a little bit kind of the improvements that come in the new Very Zexy paper, which is super relevant and super exciting for this, but then also Halo 2 and the ability to, you know, potentially modularize um, a, a commitment scheme, a gate expression, and then also maybe even like a pairing operation. If you even have a pairing operation, some people are putting some of these uh, options and some of these uh, improvements into into like transparent snarks that are coming. And then the two particular examples I'm gonna go through is <clears throat> hashing, so fast hashing, and uh, elliptic curve operation. So one for hashing these epoch blocks and uh, the following one for doing operations as, as Kobe spoke about on the, the two chain curve. So the, BW, the BLS12377, sorry, into the, um, the BW6 and how some of these operations can be made a little bit cheaper um, and a little bit more efficient and at what cost within different types of proving systems. So the aim of, of, of Plumo, very, I think, uh, naively, is fast blockchain syncing to allow resource constrained devices, even more so than, um, you know, Ethereum nodes attempting to be run on relatively low latency computers, but actually mobile phones to catch up with the latest state of um, of, of the chain, knowing that only at this given point, uh, sorry, knowing that at, at this given point, so long as some proof passes, everything in the past, um, some some proof representing the past six months, everything since the chain's history can be uh, can be trusted. And it's very important on the, the top right, the state of the art here, that we're thinking about the seller implementation, because I have been going through this quite a lot, um, uh, quite recently. And it's it's a it's a Rust implementation. It's authored by by many of the people uh, listening in today, and some people who, who aren't here. But also, it's uh, it's it's the mobile. It's the only I think end to end complete one. Correct me if I'm I'm wrong, but it's also the most robust. And I think it's the one that's uh, definitely worth poking holes and seeing what the next iterations could look like. And as I said, the tools used here are going to be the two chain curves and the epoch syncing and this this block hashing. The reason I got asked, uh, I think, to do this and kind of my uh, relevance and pertinence to the issue at the moment is because as part of the Z Prize or, or Z Prize, depending on which side of the Atlantic you you, you stem from, is uh, is an open competition at the moment for those who can implement uh, an, a Plumo inside of a Plonk proving system. And there'll be uh, some, some hints, as I could say, given today or some uh, recommended methods to definitely try out to get lower constraint counts than will be required as well as a couple of the other advantages that can come from plonk or, or flexi style so the first one we're going to talk about this this comp this uh comparison between the two so just to remind ourselves what r1cs systems 
uh, look like these rank one constraint systems just take three sparse matrices we'll call them a b and c you can call them one two and three and it just sums up all of the values of some a times by all the values of some b and show that it should be c so it's kind of your your left wire times by your right wire equals output wire and it's done for every single index around a circuit so standardly because these allow for for free linear combinations up to a, a very high ratio of um additions these systems are pretty inexpensive on the prover quite inexpensive on the verifier and have small proof size however often because of the uh, way in which we can express operations so the way in which you could do like a hashing operation which could be you know as as an algorithm quite complex in its form you could say narrowed down in scope like you're really you're really taking something that it has quite large levels of expressionism for, for, for moving around um, uh, like non-native uh, efficient hashes and you're, you're, you're compiling it or you're putting it sort of in a box where you just have this A times B equals C. And in some cases, uh, especially with some more um, well-designed protocols that aren't just a, a fixed expression of polynomials, like let's say like Plumo, where you're doing lots of different types of operations to try and leverage high flexibility and really high creativity uh, it might not be best always to go okay well we must force everything down to this lower constraint even if it is a little bit quicker um or a little bit you know more easily verified or a little bit bit cheaper so the other option or the alternative is some kind of flexible zero knowledge construction so rather than compiling things down to this a times b equals c we could even have like a to the n times b to the n is c to the n, so high degree polys. You could even have a times b times c times d times e times f times g, all, all the way to the, to, to the last of the 26 equals some output. And even more so, you could do a times b times c plus d plus e, and, and I'll go through and I'll work. But basically, its expressionism is, is far greater. And now with some of the, the more interesting techniques coming out, we see... A bit of a better setup standardly. It's not on all of these proving systems, but Cello, based on what was you know in the in the initial Zexi paper, is um, a, a one-time and like a, a non-updatable and a non-universal uh, trusted setup that's probably talked about. So once it exceeds a number of participants, the numbers of those powers, it'll have to sort of be redone. So whereas if this was instantiated with a an updatable snark is one that usually falls into this uh, more flexible proving system. You would see a way of um, a way, way of being able to just run this trusted set at once, and people will be able to just add on um, additionally beyond uh, the number of setup, the number of participants that it was initially instantiated for. There are of course some down downsides here. You can have larger verification cost. The verification cost it, it's pretty easy. To understand in the, in the R1CS, it's basically linear in the number of um, letters of the alphabet. So you get your ABC. So it's you know three times um, some some cost. But if you start to go A B C D E L M N O right to the end, you get oh, okay. So you have actually much higher much higher costs in terms of verifying all of these at once. And you know we see this with with Plonky two style, where you have 128 polynomials, which is great. Um, for being able to, to chop down the operations on the prover side, but it's just insane to deal with. And to, on the verification side, you then have to lean into looking to some kinds of levels of recursion and things that can make the protocol uh, a bit more difficult to handle with and maybe a bit more, in some ways, uh, nonsensical. So to look at some of the, the things we have in the, one of the current, uh, sorry, in the current implementation, we look at curve, curve tricks and like alternative hashings. Um, some work that I did last year with uh, a cryptographer from, from Anoma was an implementation of, of Blake2S. So looking at some in-circuit hashing done, if we have uh, Blake2S uh, as a chosen primitive, which is a, a fantastic chosen primitive for its security, it falls much more into the bracket of uh, what, what I've called TOT here, so the, the, the test of time. I don't know if, it all, if many or TOT even acronym or initialism you, you want to go for basically ones where we've seen over some time that the crypt analysis is, is pretty strong and the um 
we, we, we're, we're quite sure of the algebraic security of these hash functions, which I understand given that some people see a lot of the new zero knowledge style with the, the S boxes as some slightly more questionable security. So if, you, if you're choosing that and you want to do it and you want to do it where you have an epoch block and I picked seven fields here to describe um, the di different things that go into this hash. So the validators, the numbers, the public keys, the signers, because it does not grow linear in, in complexity. It's super linear. We end up with what's on number three here. So non-native field operations. These um, standardly renowned algebraically secure hashes, some of you like, you know, the, the, well, plausibly post-quantum ones like SHA-256, they work with bits. They work with these um, bits and bit shifting for, for chunks. But when you operate over snarks, a lot of this bit, bit, bit shifting and these bit chunkings are uh, really quite inefficient. It's difficult to express um, some of these operations inside of a finite field, inside of some large prime number line. So you end up having reasonable uh, trade-offs with security. And, and with some of the other functions, Blake 2S is not as bad. Um, it's really quite uh, expensive on the protocol to, to run some of these exclusive OR operations, et cetera, in tables. However, if you're able to use a, uh, a proving system, which allows to leverage, let's say, an example, new technique like lookups where you pre-compute these operations, these exclusive OR operations between um, different, si different size bits and just bring them in as a, as a table so you can like look them up. It's like index and lookup like it's done a lot in uh, the, the standard computing world. You, you can omit the cost of very expensive operations and sort of have them pre-done and just prove that they were done correctly. So this, this kind of operation is done a lot quicker it allows you, when, 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 uh, when Josh and I did it, we had a four bit, also please tell me if there's too much background noise, I will put my headphones in. Um, Josh and I did it for, for four bit, it looks like we got a 50% improvement and this was a very unoptimized version. We ended up having a look at eight bit operations, so much wider uh, or much larger inputs into this table, but it became too memory intensive. So again, we're falling ourselves into the world of quite significant trade-offs where if you're having somebody sync um, to the cello chain through a mobile phone, you don't want them to have to download also gigabytes worth of table. It'd be great if you could just import tables with pre-computed answers for everything, but, uh, but we don't. We don't get the, uh, the luxury of that. So seeing that you can, you can take some more modern techniques with more flexible proving systems or with more uh, feature intensive proving systems, you know, can, can potentially improve the, some of the aspects or components within, uh, within the um, Pluma protocol. So the next one to look at is going to be two chain improvements. A lot of this, if you guys haven't, haven't seen it yet, came from the new, oh, sorry, came from the new very Zexy paper. It was kind of a, a next iteration or a bit of an augmentation to, to Zexy done by the Espresso Systems teams, you know, where they kind of take the main, um, expensive operations like pairing checks, doing multi-scalar multiplications, polynomial evaluations over fields, and then different FS or different uh, VHMIR operations, and improve the way they do by actually specially curating each of those gate checks. So rather than the gate checks be, as I said, A, B equals C, can be some A plus B times D plus this selector polynomial plus that one, um, you can kind of ad hoc design around what you're looking for best in your protocol. And that can be all the way down to what is the best way to, um, to, to, to express you know, a cheap elliptic curve operation whilst not making it super inefficient for all of our you know, range checks or so. So the quick example here is um, to look at this two chain uh, elliptic curve operation. So if you're checking multiple signatures on the, on the bottom left here, in this white box with the 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 little the BLS 12377 and BW6, you're just basically aggregating lots and lots of these signatures done on, on BLS, and you can check them for free, which is really, really nice in one check, irrespective. And, and you do it on this, this outer curve. Um, you, you have that right now in the, the implementation. You end up with reasonably high <coughs> sorry, reasonably high circuit complexity. Uh, one of the reasons is because you could say compared to a lot of other SNARK protocols, which just aim for the, the golden window of security of the 
kind of 128 bits, you end up getting more, um, more, more, more bid intensive operations. And then you get these formulae, which I'll, I'll show you the formula on the next slide, which is standardly quite expensive. Oh, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> which is standardly uh, quite malleable. And they've ended up being, if you look at like the Hissel Wong papers uh, from 2008 on the, you know, the fast Edwards editions, they've ended up being quite expressive and quite far away from the, the, a, the AB equals C. And putting them down to fix, fixed constraints can have a much, um, a much larger um, cost than what is just linear to the, to the change in number of variables. And the last quick one on the bottom right, um, the, the elliptic curve being in addition, uh, inefficient for additions and multiplications. Basically what I'm saying there is R1CS boils down to additions and multiplications. And whilst everything in a circuit boils down to, well, boils down technically to just lots and lots of additions, just many, many, many times over, there are ways with, with lookup tables and in, in this, this ECC, some constants and some inversions and some embedding some amounts of some scalars and some elliptic curve inversion tricks where you're able to sort of hop. You can kind of hurdle over um, standardly expensive operations like, well, like with multiscalar multiplication, like being able to break down a scalar and do it in, in parts rather than just actually do... Um, you know, get to your public key or get to some point on the curve by doing P times itself, N times, times your secret key times. There's ways to, to hop around. Otherwise, computers really will be there forever, some would say, exponentially. So the, the example I'm going to, well, example uh, that I'm going to show today is just how to uh, leverage uh, a more flexible constraint system to present, to, to should we say, rework a gate instead of being this, and I'd say promising for the last time, this, this A times B is equal to C, into being able to, to express some um, A times B times D divided by C times D times E times plus, et cetera. I'll show you on the next slide, which, um, which gives us a way to sort of tailor to the operations you're doing rather than have the operations kind of be tailored back into to what, to what the proving system uh, is fixed as. So if we... Uh, I'll try. I'll try to not make this 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 too intensive. I promise it. It does. It does make some sense. Because in the in the jellyfish library, the elliptic curve additions are done in in two constraints. Whereas many many operations uh, and many many existing libraries out there will be doing uh, bit curves of, of that size and operations of like three hundred and such constraints. And you see the same with uh, different hash implementations like the Poseidon. It's done in, in one gate in Plonky 2, in 953 gates in, uh, in, the, in the Dusk Plonk, and in 400, and maybe like 400 gates in uh, the, the Filecoin Neptune, uh, hyper-optimized one. So you see the ability to make slightly different level. And then, oh, then, oh, sorry, into the thousands, into the Arcworks Groth 16. So you can see the different types of proving system giving different levels of, uh, of constraint counts. So if you look at the... Uh, do you see gate equations at the top? If we're looking for like a point X3 and Y3, so we're not going NP a trillion times or whatever this huge secret key is, we're just trying to get to number three. So you've got our first point, our X1 and our X2. You're, you have this system check, this um, this this X, uh, this this X1 uh, times Y2 plus X2 times Y1 divided by 1 plus D, which is some curve constant times X1 times Y1 x2 y2 if we could check all of these at the same time we'd be um i think we'd really be in there that that golden window would be in the money so if you can rewrite your your gate check to look into um some multiplication selective of when you need to have some amount and also embed a constant like this this d into a selector which is the, the qecc some selector polynomial you can get to the sort of next gate check uh, no, sorry, the next point uh, in, in two checks by just creating the flexible constraint system to fit those two equations at the top um, and then just selectively turning on whatever um, of, of the larger equation, so, you know, whichever, sorry, uh, polynomials are going to describe this, um, this operation. And just to sort of wrap a little bit, 
I think some things that are worth adding because we're at the, the, the stage in the zero knowledge community where this can be so ad hoc and back and forth is maybe some uh, little pointers. One on the, on the top left, it's not impossible, for example, to add lookups to R1CS. I had a little look into it. Well, I, I did a little hack MD in it recently for some memory checks. I know I actually won't say the other people who are doing it because maybe it's a little stealthy, um, but you know they just add um, extra extra row checks into the larger matrices. But you're looking at uh, rather than one lookup, one constraint, you're looking at like, uh, one, one lookup, eight constraints. So it, it is more inefficient, but it, it's not impossible nor is it an impossible to find different ways in uh, in fixed proving systems to work, nor is it if you were to pick the Marlin proving system, you know, is it required to have this uh, this one, this um, non-updatable setup? You can have a universal uh, reference string without needing to uh, use Plonk or, or to, to use, or even go into, you know, um, a, a trustless setup. I think it's very, very important in the, to look, think about the one in the top right, about how high degree constraints must, they absolutely must be handled with care. The last thing you want is to just allow for 500 variables um, or gate um, checks inside of some, uh, inside of some uh, equa um, sorry, proving system and then end up with the, the need for the verifier to, to wait for an hour on its phone to check a proof, but it's okay because he, he proved it in one second. And some things I didn't touch on today, but feel free to, to get me afterwards because I've got all of this written down is it kind of extra optimizations. Um, the most interesting one of these is for me is the online lookup tables. So actually not even having them downloaded, but having them just checkable um, with some indexing operation to a, to a cloud or to some kind of kind of server that can you know, potentially allow it for for much larger operations which is uh, gets rid of the, can get rid of the memory problem and then the Merkel variance that was um, written at the end whether you go for Merkel mountain ranges or you look for for Merkel inclusion proofs these are also things that can be improved obviously by by the hashing unlikely or or not recommended to be doing too much with the the Blake 2s um, <clears throat> but but definitely with some uh, circuit friendly and it allows you to shoot your way up this discrete log based structure as, as, as fast as possible. So you can sort of check what, what you have in your leaf against the, the, um, the state, the state route. And then I didn't really talk about it today, <laughs> but that's because um, even though it's the title of the whole thing, uh, privacy, uh, there's different ways to, to look at adding privacy into the protocol. It might require an extra level of uh, abstraction, the kind of way you have the, the ZK, ZK rollups or, or encodings or, or something that for um, adding, I guess, definitely more expressive gate operations inside of a, of a Plumer implementation. And the last one would be um, changing the, the level of recursion such you could uh, have a much higher verifier cost to something like proof carrying data. So I hope that was as enjoyable for everybody to listen to as it was for me to present it. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Maybe this, if there's some in the chat, I can... I'll stop sharing and I'll jump to that. Uh... Yes, uh, we can leave the questions in the ask a question tab and over there you can uh, answer everything that's going to uh, pop up. Thank you very much. Once again, enjoy your holidays. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for having me. All right, so we are arriving at the end of our uh, event. We have one more speaker, Poverty Alleviation Digital Payments and Fraud with Andrew Vaziri. Andrew, I'm inviting you to the stage. I hope no more technical problems. Okay, I see that Andrew is accepting and connecting. So we're waiting. Hello. Hello, hello. The stage is yours, sir. Well, thank you for having me and uh, happy to be here. I didn't know about the hat theme in advance. So Luke had an unseen hat and Kobe had a augmented reality hat and Victor had X hat. Um, uh, but I have fetched- No hats were required, but- <laughs> um, So now uh, let's begin and uh, I will share my screen.
Okay, enough of that. <laughs> Great. So uh, poverty alleviation, digital payments, and fraud. Um, no cryptography in this presentation, but um, hope to provide value to everyone here uh, by giving you a really concrete example of what it means to say that privacy is the next thing. Um, we've heard from Victor about oblivious pseudo-random functions. Um, I'm your oblivious presenter relating feature requests. So please uh, email me, share in chat anything that you think would be relevant as I describe what we do. Always happy to learn more about every uh, amazing thing that's being made by the community. Uh, who is Give Directly? Uh, Give Directly is a charity that sends cash to those living in poverty with no strings attached. Um, we're one of the fastest growing NGOs focused on international issues. So we've reached over a million recipients. We have given away almost a billion dollars, uh, worked in 11 countries. And um, our approach generally follows four phases. So first we target, then enroll, then transfer, then monitor. In the targeting stage, we're trying to assess uh, who would benefit from our programs, who's in extreme poverty. In the enrollment stage, we're going out in person, we're finding them, we're making sure that we're not double counting people, that we haven't passed over anyone, and we're teaching them how to use uh, perhaps a feature phone, perhaps mobile money, um, various technologies that they would use in the next phase, which is transfer. So here we're integrated with local payment providers, and we will send um, payments, actually, even to the, the most poor people in the world, that we found that sending them digital payments is um, preferable. Uh, there's less risk of theft. Even in many of these villages, people don't have windows at all. They might not have doors that can lock. Um, so having a pin code that protects your finances is more feasible than, than even uh, lower tech solutions. And finally, we monitor. So we have follow-up surveys. We make sure that we speak with each recipient. We know that they received their money, that they had no issues. Um, we have a hotline that they can call if they're having issues. And we have dashboards where we monitor uh, for anything out of the normal. Um, what about when there is something out of, out of the normal? What, what kind of uh, fraud have we seen? So Give Directly has lost $241,633. Uh, in 2021. And that's about what we expect. We think it's very important to be extremely candid about the challenges we face. Every major nonprofit does experience losses from external fraud, um, but few rigorously investigated and safeguard against it. And we're very happy to be able to share these um, metrics with you. So the, the three types of, of losses that we track would be theft, imposters, and bribes. So theft is when somebody transfers funds or property uh, without the consent of the recipient. Uh, bribes would be when someone coerces a recipient to give or transfer funds uh, as a way to pay back for some sort of favor. And then uh, imposters are people who, through some false pretenses, uh, sneak their way into a program for which they would not normally be eligible. And that sort of loss is a loss to give directly, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, represent a loss to a particular recipient. So for the rest of this presentation, I'll be speaking more so about bribes and theft. When we try to reduce fraud, we have a number of methods. I described in our standard approach um, a number of things, training, hotlines, follow-ups, uh, but we have an additional team that's completely separate called recipient advocacy. So they're firewalled from our other teams. They have their own reporting structure. In fact, the two teams don't know each other's identities. And they will go and reach out, um, being local members of the communities, uh, able to speak to people in their native language, and uh, just double check that everything was above board. And this is especially useful when we want to do an internal audit to make sure that our partners or our own staff aren't doing anything they shouldn't. And finally, we perform risk assessments. So we will uh, seek out to understand if there's something about a particular community that requires more precautions. And in the cases where we, we see this higher risk, um, we will do a couple things. We might randomize when and where to send staff. So we won't go geographically to each village down a, one road. We'll kind of go to different uh, areas of the county in a random order to prevent uh, fraudsters or imposters from knowing where to meet us uh, in advance. We'll also conceal who's participating by registering uh, recipients in private. It's more efficient to 
register everybody together as a group, but in some cases that's just not feasible for their safety. And then we'll also stagger payments. So there isn't a day when everybody gets their money and everybody who was part of the program is going to the store and is seen shopping, but instead it gradually rolls out and there, we're not leaking through some side channel uh, who was or was not participating. Um, and despite all of that, we still see the fraud that I mentioned on the last slide. And this is while using payment methods that are certainly um, centralized at the current moment, but also private. The only people who have access to that information are the telecoms who operate these mobile money payment networks, uh, governments, and the parties who sent and received the payments. Um, and so we would, we would see that level of fraud even in a relatively um, locked down uh, privacy situation. And how would Give Directly uh, continue our mission and continue to integrate more deeply in Web3? Well, first of all, we already get a lot of funds in from uh, crypto donors. We have accepted donations since 2014, um, which is fairly early. And because of that, it was before um, a lot of the more convenient ways. So we still do uh, accept direct crypto donations to our wallet addresses. We've raised 50 million in direct crypto donations. That's about 5% of our total revenue as an organization. So very, very healthy um, amount of donations and we appreciate the support from the community. In terms of funds out, presently, as I said, we're using mobile money. These are centralized digital payment platforms operated by telcos and they are fit for purpose. Uh, but we are interested in exploring potential benefits of using distributed technology and we've seen that this is possible to, to echo what Merrick said in the beginning um, because of uh, the ability to use stable coins, to pay your fees in stable coins and have interfaces for feature phones. So phones that uh, are not even as computationally powerful as a smartphone um, that are the most common sort of phone held by the unbanked. Um, I won't go into detail about the benefits of a centralized versus decentralized approach, but um, take it that this audience appreciates those. And let's let's move to what are the fraud risks and what are the mitigations and, and essentially where is the place of privacy? <clears throat> so in a naive implementation um, of a blockchain, some people might say, well, it's anonymous, but I think, um, de-anonymization should be assumed. In a naive implementation, the first time you transact with someone, if you can view them in public making a payment at a local vendor, um, any of these things could immediately let you uh, look up their um, address and de-anonymize their balance, de-anonymize de their, their past transactions. Uh, we should also be careful whenever we link mobile phones to these public financial records. Um, We've talked a little bit about the risks associated in, in Victor's talk, um, but it does make everything more convenient to be able to use uh, some sort of signifier like a mobile phone. And unfortunately, a subset of everything is crime. So uh, we definitely want to be careful around that. And lastly, uh, we should be aware that public transactions and balances increase risks already present in mobile money contexts. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few examples which have absolutely happened to give directly recipients in a mobile mo money context. And in that case, remember, their transactions were private. So in the case of theft, you might uh, imagine somebody pay at a local store and you could check the blockchain for their balance and then follow them home and threaten them with violence on the road once your uh, no, no passersby will find you. Um, to uh, receive their, their transfer. In bribery, you could imagine that once an official takes a payment, they now know the identity of the person who paid them. They could check their balance. They could start adding fees or other ways to coerce more money uh, for a promised service. Uh, we could have phishing attacks. By reviewing transaction history, um, people could be called and the, the person who's phishing them could pretend to be a representative of a recent transaction. Um, so we, we have people call recipients and pretend to be staff of Give Directly already. And I'm sure that that would be even more uh, convincing when they knew the details of the, every moment when the transactions were sent, their exact amount, things that people might not intuit um, would be available. Um, lastly, uh, scams. They target the most vulnerable people generally, the elderly, the illiterate, 
uh, people in marginalized groups. And so we need to be, be careful not to make it easy for scammers to cross-reference uh, phone numbers with the vulnerable and understand their ability to pay by knowing their balances. And finally, maybe the one that's not actually a crime but is important to, to recognize is that we're trying to give unconditional cash. We find that it has the most benefit when people can really spend it freely according to what they think is best. And they might need to spend it on things that would be um, not socially uh, promoted in their local context, but which they think is right for their life. Perhaps they need to move somewhere else. Perhaps they want to send a female child to school. Whatever it is, uh, we want them to be able to do that without the social pressure of being observed. Uh, so we have mitigations. We can have balance in transaction privacy. We can enable these sorts of technologies by default to protect the most vulnerable. Those are the people who aren't going to be tech savvy enough to kind of uh, redirect their funds through multiple steps. They're going to need it to be private and secure by, by default. And lastly, we need the fees to remain low to drive usage that people won't disable such features. Um, so very happy to hear about all the improvements in proof technologies that could keep the costs of such things uh, reasonable for people who are making most of their transactions for less than a dollar. Um, so in summary, Andrew, yeah. just uh, one um, thing, we have two more minutes. Yep, yep. Um, in summary, we want to protect our recipients from adverse outcomes. We want to gain the confidence of funding organizations. I want to be really concrete here. When people say that, that privacy is the next frontier, uh, when I am talking with funders, when we are talking about potentially million dollar grants that would onboard many thousands of people onto the blockchain, uh, we run into this issue of how are we going to protect them? And until we have uh, better privacy protections, a lot of those contracts are on hold. So I want to be um, your face to the problem that, that we are already in a position where Cello has done a great job lining up all of the things that we need to have a cash-like, Venmo-like transaction. And this is really the, the final stepping stone before I think we would see uh, really increased adoption and uh, thank you everyone for your work on these problems. Uh, and finally, we want to compete with existing centralized payment systems. Uh, privacy is built into those centralized systems to some extent. Uh, we don't see a lot of leaks of information from the people who are running them. Um, and so uh, reaching parity there will help us make the case that uh, it's worth it to move to Web3 uh, and it's worth it for the other benefits. Uh, thank you for inviting me. If you have any uh, poverty alleviation, universal basic income, or humanitarian work, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, also, would love if you would upvote some of our privacy-related feature requests. And if you'd like to donate to give directly, uh, I will paste those addresses into the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And we arrived to the end of our event. So thank you very much for uh, joining us. One more thing, remember to uh, claim your POAP. We're gonna send it in the, in the chat once again. And thank you for joining us. And if you want to directly support us, please remember to vote for us. Here is our website, our Twitter account. You can uh, follow us on Twitter for more news on Cello and all the networks that we are validating. Read our blog post on Medium. And if you want to directly contact us, please email us at events at zkvalidator.com. Let me just uh, see if all the links are in. Yes, all the links are in. Oh, we don't see the slides. OK. So you have all the links in the chat. I think that's enough. Thank you once again. Thank you to all the speakers. I'm pretty sure you enjoyed it as much as I did. And see you hopefully on the next uh, Privacy on Cello. <laughs>